let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 309. 309, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. Beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. The shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land, a home within the wilderness, a rest upon the way. From the burning of the noonday heat and the burden of the day, upon that cross of Jesus mine eye at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me and from my smitten heart with tears to wonders i confess the wonders of his glorious love and my own worthlessness i take o cross thy shadow for my abiding place i ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of his face content to let the world go by to know no gain nor loss my sinful self my only shame my glory all the cross let's take our bibles and for our scripture reading and commentary in ezekiel let's turn to ezekiel chapter 11 And I'm going to read for us from verse 1 down to verse 12. There's a break here, a natural break, between what we read here from 1 to 12, which is a prophecy of continued condemnation against Jerusalem and the people of Jerusalem that God was bringing through the nation of Nebuchadnezzar. But then the last part, 13 to 25, is a message of hope that God determined that he would not completely destroy that nation of Judah. And we know why, because he would preserve it as was promised to David. There would be a seed to sit upon his throne in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but here... We have a picture of what we've already been seeing ever since chapter 8. 8, 9, 10, 11 are all this view that was given to Ezekiel of the glory of the Lord departing from the temple. That's as much as saying God removing his blessing, God removing his presence. And so here in verses 1 through 4, we read, moreover, the Spirit lifted me up, and again, that ought to be a capital S, and brought me unto the east gate of the Lord's house, which looketh eastward. And here it is again, when you read these, and behold, this is to catch our attention, behold, at the door of the gate, five and twenty men, among whom I saw Jazaniah, the son of Azur, and uh, Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, princes of the people. If you wonder why these were pointed out, it's because they were the leaders of the rebels. We might not know much about them, but uh, 
these would be every bit as much like Paul talked about of those that opposed him in his day in the gospel. Then said he unto me, Son of man, these are the men that devise mischief and give wicked counsel in this city. How are they devising mischief? By leading the people in idolatry. These are the ones that had their backs toward the temple that we already saw earlier in Ezekiel chapter 8 and were actually directing the worship away from the temple to the sun. They were sun worshipers. But here in verse 3, again their rebellion which say, it is not near. Let us build houses. This city is the cauldron and we be the flesh. So even though Jeremiah had prophesied and Ezekiel, remember they were contemporary, that this destruction was certain, they were saying, no, it's not. It's not near. In other words, even though Nebuchadnezzar had already come down and twice and taken people into captivity, here's the picture like I've often used of cattle eating grass and the butcher truck shows up and they load up a few and the cattle just kind of observe and watch what's going on, and when it disappears down the road, what do they do? Go right back to eating. Here, when it says this city is the cauldron, you, you normally think of a cauldron as something that you cook flesh in. But here would be specifically where meat was preserved, put in a big pot to be cooked at some point. Oftentimes, they would put salt in it to help preserve it and keep it. They didn't have refrigeration back then. And so the sense of the word cauldron here is that we be the flesh. In other words, everybody else has already been taken off. That's how they were reasoning, those first two exiles. But we're left, so that means we're preserved, and uh, we're the good meat. We're the, one, we're, the, we're the ones that are better than those that were taken. That's what they were prophesying. Therefore, verse 4, the Lord says, Prophesy against them. Prophesy, O son of man. And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me. Now there they got it right when they translated. Here is capital S. And said unto me, Speak thus, saith the Lord. Thus have ye said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. Here our Lord is pointing out that it's not just the external activities that condemned them, even though it was idolatry, but it's what's in the heart. Where does idolatry begin? But in the heart. The departure from the truth is always in the heart. In verse 6, you've multiplied... You're slain in this city, and ye have filled the streets thereof with the slain. You might say, well, how have they multiplied the slain in the city? Well, it's because of their false leadership that God was bringing judgment on the people. This is representation. As go the preachers, so go the people. And I know some try to reason and think, well, why... Does God blame the people when his fault was with the preachers? Well, people are at fault for listening to them, for following them, for supporting them. I dare say in our modern day, if people stopped giving to these false preachers and would not support them, they would shut it down. It would be shut down. How would they live? Go ahead and starve them out. But ye have multiplied your slain in this city, and ye filled the streets thereof with the slain. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, your slain, you see on who he puts the blame here, your slain, whom ye have laid in the midst of it, they are the flesh, and this city is the cauldron, but I will bring you forth out of the midst of it. So he's taking that illustration of you've saved up this meat, supposedly considering yourselves to be the preserved ones, but look at all the slain in the streets as a result of Nebuchadnezzar's 
a tax on that city and that people. But he says, now indeed you will be the flesh in the midst of the cauldron. And there the symbolism changes now to what a cauldron, what, what you do with a cauldron. You preserve it in the pot until it's time to put it on the fire. And the Lord's saying, now's the time to put it on the fire. But here's a message of hope. He says, I will bring you forth out of the midst of it. I say a message of hope, but in reality, it's the Lord letting them know that not all would die. There would be those that would be, be preserved. This is not going to be the end of the story for Judah and for those people that remain alive. This would not be the last word of this Babylonian conquest. It says, I will bring you forth out of the midst of it. So there would be those that most certainly would die by God's direction. There would be those that would be taken into captivity again, according to his purpose. And those would be brought forth out of the midst of it. It's God that determines who lives and who dies. This is not up to man. So when he says, I will bring you out of the midst of it, it is to do what? Well, it says in verse 8, you have feared the sword, and I will bring a sword upon you, saith the Lord God. It's like so many people today know there's a judgment. And yet, they will not follow how God has declared that he should be approached. But that judgment that was put on the Lord Jesus Christ is the only escape. And all others will suffer at the hand of God in judgment. But even that doesn't change the way man lives. Man continues to be an idolater by nature. We see it in our day. Religion is a popular business. And even though knowing the judgment of God and that the entirety of this book we're reading here points to the judgment upon any that are outside of Christ, yet people continue to pursue their own way. But the Lord said, I'll bring a sword upon you, that very sword that you feared. Talk to most people today, they're afraid of judgment. And especially as it comes closer to time to dying. People begin to try to straighten up their lives and regret what they did. None of that's going to change the sword. When I said he's, these, some of these would be preserved alive, look what verse 9 says. I will bring you out of the midst thereof. So even those who did escape death that were brought out or were able to escape out of the city, what does it say? Deliver you into the hands of strangers and will execute judgments among you. So in reality, no escape, even though some lived longer than others. In the end, God had purposed to bring judgment upon them. And he would continue to deal with them wherever they scattered. There was no escape. Ye shall fall by the sword. And notice he says, I will judge you in the border of Israel. Think about all around the border of Israel. They've escaped out of Jerusalem, perhaps, but... They're caught in this net that God has cast of his judgment. And sooner or later, they will endure God's judgments or suffer God's judgments at the hand of other enemies, not just Nebuchadnezzar. So this is what it's talking about here when it says, in the border of Israel. Remember that Israel was a synonym of the northern tribes. So these that were down south thought, well, we'll escape up north where it won't be so bad. But the Lord says even there he would bring his judgment to pass. Here's where we see that God in his sovereignty and his judgments, he'll extend these wherever he has purposed the condemnation of sinners. None will escape. In verse 11, well, end of verse 10, here's the reason. Ye shall know that I am the Lord. People trifle with that today. They speak of God as if he's a buddy or even a genie. Rub the bottle a little bit and out comes what you want. 
No, he's sovereign God. He's the Lord. And you will know it. Those that he saves know that he's Lord. Those that he condemns will know that he is the Lord. Capital L-O-R-D. And it says, this city shall not be your cauldron. Now it goes back to that first image of that pot where meat was stored. Where they thought that somehow they would be preserved. This city shall not be your cauldron. Neither shall ye be the flesh in the midst thereof. What, they're talking, what he's talking about there is the good flesh, the preserved flesh. Somehow you've escaped what these others have endured. No, not even that city, that cauldron, would be a refuge for any that remain there. Because that's what they were saying. Well, so long as the temple stands, we're all right. We got the temple. And the Lord's telling them, no, judgment is certain and sure. Jerusalem would not be any protection for them at all, nor will any man's religion. People will hold on to their profession and their works and their zeal and all these things, but it won't stand in the day of judgment. And again, it's repeated twice. Verse 12, ye shall know that I am the Lord. I don't believe that we've preached God aright as he is in scripture unless we preach him as he is indeed as the Lord. People use that. He's Lord. He's Lord. But that means he's sovereign. He's sovereign in creation. He's created all things for his pleasure through his son. He's sovereign in providence. The outworking of every detail of history is God working it out. It's not man's. It's God's history. And he's sovereign in salvation. Who he saves is according to his sovereign will and He's sovereign in condemnation. There's none that will be able to say in that day of judgment, well, I didn't deserve it. You shall know that I am the Lord, for ye have not walked in my statutes. You stop and think about what all of God's statutes were about. What were all those types and pictures and prophecies all about? It was the coming of the Son, of the Lord Jesus Christ. That temple was a picture of who he was. And yet they turned their back on it, these leaders that were mentioned here earlier, led people to worship the creature rather than the creator. Neither executed my judgments, but have done after the manners of the heathen that are round about you. Beware of popular religion. Beware of looking around and seeing what other so-called congregations are doing. Well, what's the latest? You know, latest book, latest fad, all these things. I say beware because it's, a, it's an ensnaring of those who don't have their eyes on Christ and the cross. And that's what was the case here. So as I said, we're going to draw a line there in verse 13 and following. We'll come back to it because... It, it pushes the cry. You can see in verse 13, it came to pass when I prophesied that Pelatia, the son of Benaiah, died. Then I, then fell I down upon my face. So this is one of those leaders that suddenly the Lord took out right before them. Here they were prophesying all along, don't, don't worry about it, everything's going to be all right. The next thing, you know, he's a corpse. God took him out. And you can see how it distressed Ezekiel. Then fell I down upon my face. I believe this is a true indication of one that serves the Lord. We're not jumping up and down rejoicing when God takes out sinners. It's a condemnation. Then fell I down upon my face and cried with a loud voice and said, Ah, Lord God, wilt thou make a full end of the remnant of Israel? Is this how you're going to do it? Well, stay tuned because the rest of the verses, he shows Ezekiel, no, he has a remnant according to the election of grace and those he would preserve even though he would take out a great number. Gracious Father, thank you for your word. How sobering it is when we consider who you are, but I pray that as we read it, 
that you might know that indeed you are the Lord and that you exercise your judgments as you will, where you will, when you will, on whom you will. And that if we've been preserved, it's not for anything in us, but it's only by your grace and because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I pray that your word would be directed to our own hearts, that we would truly worship you. And we're mindful to give you the praise, honor, and glory in Christ's precious name. Amen. Let's turn to hymn number three. Sing praise to God who reigns above the God of all creation. The God of power, the God of love, the God of our salvation. With healing balm, my soul he fills, and every faithless murmur stills to God all praise and glory. With God's almighty power hath made his gracious mercy keepeth by morning glow. Or evening shade, his watchful eye ne'er sleepeth. Within the kingdom of the night, lo, all is just and all is right. To God all praise and glory. The Lord is never far away. But through all grief, distress, and, and ever present help and stay, or peace and joy and blessing, as with a mother's tender hand he leads his own, his chosen band. To God all praise and glory. Thus all my toilsome way along, I sing aloud thy praises, That men may hear the grateful song My voice on unmoderated raises. Be joyful in the Lord, my heart, both soul and body. Bear your part to God, all praise and glory. Amen. Worthy of all praise. <clears throat> Let's take our Bibles and look in Matthew chapter 8. And my text is going to be from verse 5 down to verse 13. And I want to speak with you about the healing of a centurion's servant. This is the next miracle that we're considering together in our study through the miracles. The healing of a centurion's servant. And I'll read here first of all from Matthew 8. 5 through 13, and then we'll go over to Luke chapter 8 and read from verse 5 to 13, because those are the two parallel portions that we have with this particular miracle that Christ did on behalf of the centurion's servant, the centurion, but particularly his servant. So here in Matthew chapter 8, and verse 5, it says, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, 
having soldiers under me. And I say to the, this man, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to him that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that ma many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. Luke chapter 7 and verse 1. And we'll read that down to verse 10. Now when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him. This is why it's good to read these. You get a little extra. I mean, this we're talking about a slave. We talk about an uncommon bond, a centurion, a Roman. But the compassion he had for this slave, that's what the word servant means. He was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, that's a an important added description there. It wasn't that he just happened upon, but when he had heard, not just with a physical ear, but being drawn here, even having heard, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. <laughs> Notice how the Jews, even these that were disciples, were trying to influence or convince Christ as to why he ought to show favor to this centurion. But that's not why God shows grace, not for anything we've done. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, Trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldst enter under my roof. So this gives us an added perspective, because here in Matthew 8, when it says there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, here it was through his servants that he would not even approach unto the Lord. So there was some kind of of uh, intermediary between him as a centurion and his view even of the Lord Jesus being high and exalted above him as you talk about a centurion they were the commanders of the day rugged men but he said I'm not worthy that thou shouldst enter under my roof wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee it doesn't contradict what we're reading over here how did he come here in Matthew 8 and verse 5, unto him, beseeching him. It was through these servants of his, his intermediaries, not even worthy to even approach himself unto Christ. And he said, there but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers, and I say unto one go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these things, it says, he marveled at him, and turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. That's why we have these various, these different gospels to help give us the complete picture that we have here. So as we look at this, first of all, I want us to consider the centurion's need. 
Christ said that they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. So here we find the centurion that sends to Christ by his servants to have mercy or pity on one of his other servants. And here we find our Lord entering back into Capernaum, there in verse 5. That's in the northern part. He had been at Jerusalem. Now he returns back up there. And this is Capernaum was where he lived and executed his ministry while he was on earth. And that's where, when it says that when he entered into Capernaum, that's where he came and he dwelt. So at the same time that our Lord is entering into Capernaum, if you can picture this on a graph, here's our Lord coming this way, and here's this centurion coming this way. And what do we see? The intersection of what I consider to be grace. That God purposed that his path should cross with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that the Lord would be merciful unto this centurion. As we saw when it says there that the centurion came unto him. There came unto him, Matthew 8, 5. A centurion beseeching him. How did he come? Well, he sent his messengers. As we saw there in Luke 1. And... Uh, Yet, we know that he would not have sent for Christ. He would not have come unto him, as is declared here, were it not that Christ was drawing him all along. That's how the centurion would know his need. First of all, the whole situation with the servant being sick unto death and the centurion loving that servant. That was all purposed by God. For this time, for this moment, that Christ might be pleased to reveal himself in him. That's the only way any sinner comes. There were multitudes. There were many that were following out of curiosity or for other reasons. But here this specific centurion is pointed out in this gospel as one in need. That's how the Lord draws sinners. He makes them to know their need. Else they would never seek a physician. And uh, draws them. Over in John chapter 6. It's good to be reminded. Of what the scriptures. Tell us about how it is that sinners come. In John chapter 6. It's very clear. In verse 44. No man. Can come to me. Except the father which hath. Sent me draw him. So all the while. That this centurion was coming to Christ. It was the Father drawing him. That's clear. It says, I will raise him up the last day. This would be one for whom Christ would die and be buried and rise again and send on high. And then, as if that's not clear enough, again, in verse 65 of John 6. These are important scriptures to understand the movement behind men's movement. There were many that were going the other way. And God directed that they go the other way. But here's one coming his way. Why this one? Was it because he was more intelligent than any of the others? Had more zeal than the other? No. The need. It was clear that unless Christ intervened on behalf of this beloved slave of his or servant, that there would be no hope. But where does that motivation derive? Here in verse 65 of John 6 it says therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father here we see the harmony between the father and the son and you've heard me say that it's between the father and the son that the work was done in salvation those for whom it's done are the beneficiaries but the work was done between the father and the son and so Here's another important detail in this. When you think about a centurion, that means he was a Gentile. He was a Roman governor, or an officer of the Roman army. Had been promoted to this position. And stop and think about it. 
Most every Jew under Roman occupation, that's how they saw their lives there in Israel, hated anything to do with the Romans, especially the centurions and those that were given charge over the people. And yet, it's interesting how the grace of God works. Here we have a Gentile, Roman, hated by the Jews, leader, officer of the Roman army, coming to a Jewish Messiah. Because Christ said salvation of the Jews. Here he was of this lineage of David, coming in the flesh. And yet none of that hindered him from coming. Why? Again, because of the need. He came not for any selfish reason either. It wasn't even exercising his authority or demanding anything of the Lord or negotiating with him, but rather on behalf of his servant, one whom he loved. And so <clears throat> we find the centurion who's drawn by Christ, a Gentile. And there again, it's a picture that Christ didn't, when, it, when the scriptures call the Lord Jesus the Savior of the world, it doesn't mean he's come to save every single sinner in the world, but it is in the ethnic sense. He's the Savior of Jew and Gentile, bond and free. And that's what we see here with regard to this centurion. He's a type and picture of those that the Lord Jesus Christ did come to save, not only from among the Jews, but also from among the Gentiles. We can almost say here he's one of the first fruits of the Gentiles that was drawn to Christ. And coming back here in Matthew 8 and verse 5, what do we find him doing? Beseeching him. Another way of putting that is pleading with him. That's what sinners do when they're made to see their need of the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't come negotiating. They don't come demanding. He didn't come just to make some casual request. No, he came pleading with him on behalf of his servant. Now, this is how the grace of God works. It makes us sensitive not only to our own need before the Lord, but that of others. And you might think, well, he's a centurion. He doesn't need this servant. He's got other servants. But the Lord had tendered this servant to his heart, as we saw over there in Luke 1. He was endeared to him. That's an evidence of grace right there. And I believe that's what Paul wrote of over in Colossians chapter 1, if you look there. These are just little evidences of grace at work in the heart of a sinner. When Paul wrote to the Colossians in verse 1 of chapter 4, he said, Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Isn't that how the centurion addressed Christ? Lord, your, your authority is high above any of mine. But I come just like you would in any kind of hierarchy, beseeching and requesting, making my request known unto you on behalf of this, my servant. That's why I say I believe this is a picture of God's grace. And so he seeks a remedy. He seeks a cure. But notice it doesn't say here that he gave any kind of direction to the Lord. There's a lot of people that when they come to the Lord, they think, well, I've got to direct him, like in their prayers. Lord, this is what you need to do for so-and-so, as if you're the one directing him. No. He simply came and laid his case before the Lord and then waited. He didn't tell him how to work or where this should be done or when it should be done. He doesn't put any of that in his words, it just simply says he came and pled his case and his own need spoke on his behalf. I believe this is what Paul writes about in Romans chapter 8. Because I get people asking me sometimes, well, when you come before the Lord, how should you pray? What, what should you say? 
Well, prayer is not a prescription. It's not a script. Go and do this or say this. That's what's so false about what we're seeing by one of these popular preachers of our day. He's got an ad out on TV. And uh, they've got the money to put it out there. He keeps repeating it. Every time I see it, I just... Ugh. Because he's telling people, if you really want to know if you're a child of God, then you do step one, two, three, you pray this prayer, you tell God this, and if you do, oh, by the way, there's an 800 number down here that you can call and let us know that you've made your testimony for, for Jesus. That, that's, that's religion. That's putting in men's mouths things to say and then leaving them with the false hope that somehow because they've said a prayer done exactly what the preacher said that now they're children of God now here in Romans chapter 8 and verse 26 now we don't know how to pray as we ought I'm sure this centurion again the fact that he sent these other messengers on his behalf knowing himself not even worthy to address the Lord Jesus Christ directly and being a man of authority, not even sending the servants with specific script of what to say to the Lord when you see him. Well, it just simply says he came pleading. And that's how the Lord does the work in the heart of a sinner as he's drawing them to Christ. Here in Romans 8, 26, it says, Likewise, what? The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Just like this servant was near unto death. That's what the... An infirmity is here, unable even to come. But it's the Spirit that draws us to Christ. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. When the Lord first began to open my heart to Christ and show me my need, my lost estate, even as a preacher... If you were to ask me today, well, what exactly did you say to the Lord? I couldn't tell you. Nor is it important. All I know is he was laying me low. And that has been, that was a darkness unlike any, any I've ever experienced in my life. Such a hole I could not even see the light until the Lord was pleased to give me light and cause me then to cry unto him. But it's not how I cried or what I said in my crying but rather as we see here was the spirit giving that utterance so that's the first point the cent centurion's need so come back here now to Matthew 8 verses 7 through 9 here's where we see that the Lord had already given this centurion some understanding of who he is. That's why I pointed out when we were reading that in Luke chapter 1. That when he had heard of Jesus. It just says here in verse 5. There came unto him a centurion. Well why did he come? He had heard of Jesus. He had heard of his person. He had heard of his work that he was doing. And he didn't come just out of curiosity. To observe these things himself. No he came out of need. And there was his plea in verse 9. Notice how he addresses our Lord Jesus. Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. In other words, unless you intervene, Lord, then there will be no hope. Now this was completely against Jewish custom even for a Jew to enter in amongst the Gentiles. And perhaps this is what this centurion even had in mind. How can I invite this Jewish Messiah into my home being a Gentile? He understood that as a Gentile, he had no merit, not even as a centurion. And yet none of that mattered to the Lord. That's the point that I see here. We find our Lord heading his way this was not going to stop our Lord simply because he was a Gentile why because this is one that the father had given him from before the foundation of the world for whom he had come 
and only just now this one was discovering it. That nothing should hinder our Lord from coming to him. Not culture, not race, but the only claim is that of being a sinner, a sinner in need. And that's who the Lord came to save. Paul said this is a worthy saying, of, worthy of all acceptation, faithful saying, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. But here we find this centurion acknowledging the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he says, first, I'm not worthy, that's the sense that the Lord gives any that he's drawing. We're not worthy. I have nothing in me, nothing but corruption. Who am I that the Lord should save a wretch like me? I listen for that in people's testimonies because there's some that believe that it's their entitlement and they reason, well, if Jesus came in the world to save everybody, I'm somebody, so he must have come to save me. It's, a, it's an, almost like an entitlement. They've never seen their need. They've never seen their unworthiness. So the fact that he, being a centurion, not only saw his unworthiness, but saw the worthiness of Christ as his authority. And he says there, but to speak the word... I love that. Christ is the word. And when he speaks the word, that is, he grants salvation according to his word. That's the only reason any of us can claim to be the Lord's. It's according to the word of the Lord himself, of Christ himself. But here, already the spirit had given this centurion this understanding of Christ's authority. Something that many today that make a profession of faith in so-called Christendom have never understood. They're almost shocked when you begin to talk to them about the sovereignty of Christ, saving whom he will. And he didn't come to save everybody, but those that the Father had given him. They're, they're appalled, many of them. Like, no, I thought it was based on my decision. No. This is what the centurion recognized all along, it was based on the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. That if he spoke the, if he but spoke the word, there would be salvation. And I'm thankful that's what the Lord does. I don't know those for whom Christ came and died when I preach. The scriptures just simply say, go out into the world and preach the gospel. The Lord will direct that word to the hearts of those that the Father has given it. And the rest, they'll go on their merry way, thinking themselves safe when they're not. But those that the Lord brings that word home to their heart, I believe they'll have this same response here as what we find with the centurion. And that's where our Lord then, in verses 10 through 13, so I read this, it might surprise you. You're going along because we know the Lord's directing it all, but then it says, when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed. So there's all this crowd following him. Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. When he's talking about, I have not found so great faith, he's not talking about quantity of faith, but quality of faith. And when he says, have not found so great faith in Israel, obviously there was faith in Israel. The, the writer to uh, James writes that in his epistle. The faith that was once delivered unto the saints. It goes all the way back to the Old Testament. That faith is talking about the object of faith. But what Christ is talking about here is that in that present state of Israel, he came unto his own, his own received him not. They turned thumbs down on him. So when he's saying here, he's really bringing this centurion up as a rebuke to those of that nation. Here's this Gentile, here's this hated Roman. And when he says, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. He's talking about 
one who was coming to Christ for who he is. What was the one thing that Israel was denying, religious Israel? They were denying that he was God. What was this centurion asking? He was asking the Lord Jesus to do a God act. Act as God, if you will, Lord. That's why he said he's not seen so great faith in all of Israel. You know, we've got people today that say they believe Jesus is God, but they don't believe that in Jesus as God. And you say, well, how can you say that? Because they don't believe that he does the saving. I can't tell you how many people are professing Christians today that say, well, I believe Jesus is God. Do you? Do you believe then that in the matter of salvation, it is entirely his work to do without any contribution on your part by your so-called free will, etc.? cetera? In other words, they back off. No, I think he expects me to do my part. Well, then you don't believe in Jesus as God. When he created the world, were you there to give him advice and counsel? Were you there as he direct all history right on down to this time? No. This is all the outworking of him as God coming in the flesh. And I believe that's the sense in which he said, I've not seen so great faith in all of Israel. Where else is anybody that believes that I am who I am? You see, in every one of his miracles that he was doing, he was proving himself to be God in the flesh. Great is the mystery of God. God was manifest in the flesh. Why was that necessary? Because apart from him coming in the flesh, there would be no salvation. He had to be that perfect representative of those people that he came to save. And this was the view that this centurion had. Now, when it says he marveled, it probably can refer not only to the fact of this so great faith, because he's the one that gave it to him, but as a man, he was empathizing with this centurion, but he also marveled at the unbelief of those around. That here with such clear demonstration of who he is, yet men in their hardness continued in their unbelief. And by this centurion coming to him, he's really declaring Christ to be the God of very God. Over in Psalm 86 and verse 15, this is a description of God that we find that Christ himself is manifesting here in what we're reading. In Psalm 86 and verse 15, it says, but thou, O Lord, art a God, what, full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. O turn unto me and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant and save the son of thine handmaid. When Christ was going through his suffering, that's what he would have prayed to his father. But he did it on behalf of his people that he came to save. And so when it says that he marveled, I believe that's to be understood of him as a man. As God, there wasn't anything that would be a surprise or catch him unawares. But as a man, we find him identifying with this one that his father was drawing all along. And uh, therefore, he marveled. I, I believe it's in the sense of rejoicing. <laughs> it's like in the beginning when the scriptures say God created all things and then he saw all that he created was good. What a marvelous, that word marvel is, it pertains to God. What a marvelous thing. That's what is being expressed here. That this one who's a Gentile should come and seek him. And then the final point to bring out here is where our Lord shows that his ultimate purpose in healing this centurion's servant, as he did, was to demonstrate that he had a people out of Gentiles and Jews who would be part of his kingdom. When he says there in verse 11 and 12, I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and the west. 
and shall sit down with who? Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. When he says from the east and the west, that means from all corners of the world. Like it says in Revelation, he's redeemed unto God a people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. Here's an example right here, this Gentile. Of course, you don't have to, this isn't the beginning. You can go all the way back to Rahab the harlot. She was a Gentile. The Lord was pleased to redeem her. But it's the Lord making it divide. And there's a couple of things here that I see. One, when he talks about they'll come and sit down in Christ's kingdom, it's a place of rest. Even as he finished the work and sat down. So those for whom he came enjoy that rest in him. Secondly, it's a place of good company, isn't it? Not for anything in us, but to enjoy the fellowship of such as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had been dead years before, and yet being dead, yet lived. And they were awaiting the same thing as this centurion. They were awaiting the death of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring them out of Sheol, that place of the dead, and to bring them into, into heaven. And that this centurion should hope to be with them. Thirdly, a place of, notice the word many. I know we can get small in our perspective because when we look around, we just see so few of us. Where, where are those that the Lord truly has taught of his son? And yet in the end, there's going to be a great number, many. That's what Christ said. He came to give his life a ransom for what? Many, the many. A number which no man can number. That ought to encourage us. That regardless of where we are in this space and time, yet the Lord has a people. I've often said there will be plenty of room in heaven, but no vacancies. Everybody's going to be there that's supposed to be there. And I see this here as a kingdom whereby all those that are be called, all those that God the Father has chosen, will be there to enjoy the presence of Christ forever. But in contrast, you'll see in verse 12, the children of the kingdom shall be cast out. That's the earthly kingdom. Everybody talking about earthly Jew, Israel today? No. That has been cast out. When Christ came and finished the work, natural Israel had no more reason to exist. If it still exists today, it's only because God promised that he preserved them all the way to the end as a nation. But it's not because they're going to inherit eternal life. There are his elect among that nation, certainly, that he will yet draw. Paul gave himself an, as an example of whom the Lord foreknew. He was one of those, like a firebrand out of the fire. But natural Israel, you see there when it says, the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into utter darkness. Don't you dare put all your hope in national Israel over there or think that somehow the world's turning around what's going on over there. Because their end is this, cast into utter darkness. In fact, Paul said of them, unto whom the uh, wrath of God has come to the uttermost. And when he says there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, that word gnashing of teeth represents anger. You gnash your teeth when you're angry. They would not have him to reign over him when he came, even though this Gentile was drawn to him to bow to him and believe on him, look to him. But those that said, we will not have this man to reign, reign over us, they'll be cast into utter darkness and there will never, ever be any repentance. Don't think when you read that where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth that somehow that means they're regretting not having received him. No, they're just as angry in hell as they were in life. Because without God granting repentance, that's all that a sinner can do is raise his fist in the face of God and be angry. But God is purpose that all judgment be in the hands of his son. And this is what this centurion was caused to see, the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ as God to save. He didn't think it was based on his pleading, but being drawn, what did he do? He pled. 
And people ask me that often. They say, well, how do you know you're one for whom Christ came and died? Well, Christ said, of all that the Father has given me, I'll not lose one. And uh, that those that he has given to his son, he says, shall come to me. And him that cometh, I will no wise cast out. Why won't he cast him out? Why didn't he cast his centurion out? Why was he merciful to his uh, servant? Because he was drawing him all along. He was one that the father had given him. And therefore, he says, those that come, I'll not, I'll not cast out. Well, I pray the Lord will strengthen us, bless us, encourage us with this word. And uh, may he ever draw our hearts to his son. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 340. Nearer, still nearer, close to thy heart. Draw me, my Savior, so gracious thou art. Fold me, O oh, fold me, close to thy breast. Shelter me safe in that haven of rest. Shelter me safe in that haven of rest. Nearer, still nearer, nothing I bring. Not as an offering to Jesus, my King. Only my sinful, now contrite heart. Grant me the cleansing thy blood doth impart. Grant me the cleansing thy blood doth impart. Nearer, still nearer, Lord, to be thine. Sin with its follies I gladly resign all of its pleasures, pomp and its pride. Give me but Jesus, my Lord, crucified. Give me but Jesus, my Lord, crucified. Nearer, still nearer, while life shall last, till safe in glory my anchor is cast. Through endless ages, ever to be nearer my Savior, still nearer to Thee. Nearer my Savior, still nearer to Thee. Amen. All right, we'll be dismissed and look forward to the next time, Lord willing.